Hello and welcome to the seventh episode of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution by the Group of International Communists Reading Group Series. Today is Monday the 4th of October 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we tackle Chapter 6, The Social Production Process in General and Chapter 7, The Communist Production. I have the new patron this week, Clara Marino, to thank. If you like extra bonus episodes, creating Discord over in the Discord server, joining in patron reading group series like this one, or just want to support the good work I do, why not head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars? Okay, let's hit it. Welcome to the seventh session of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution. Today we are Really getting into the thick of it, we are starting chapter six, a very short one, and chapter seven. We'll see if we can get all the way through today. It should be worth giving it a shot. Chapter seven in particular is the real meat of the entire book where we're starting to get into the positive description of what they're talking about, as opposed to critique of the existing tendencies at the time. Okay, so... Chapter six, the social production process in general. Hands up, who wants to take this first bit of a reading session? Alan. All right, chapter six, social production process in general. A, production and reproduction. Through its production apparatus, humanity has created an organ to meet its diverse needs. With the help of machines and tools, Human labor fights against nature in order to distribute a stream of labor products over the earth using natural raw materials. This working process is the production process. It not only produces goods, but also absorbs many machines and tools as well as the labor itself. From this point of view, the production process is a process of demolition, of destruction. But at the same time, we create new values in this process of destruction. Machines, tools, and our labor are consumed, but at the same time, renewed, restored, reproduced. The social production process runs like the life process in the human body, through self-destruction to self-construction in a continuously more complicated form. Whatever the form of the process of production in a society, it must be a continuous process, must continue to go periodically through the same phases. When viewed, therefore, as a connected whole, and is flowing on with incessant renewal, every social process of production is, at the same time, a process of reproduction. B, capitalist production. It is precisely in the laws of movement of this constant renewal, in the laws of movement of reproduction, that capitalism presents itself as an uncontrolled and revolutionary system. It knows no standstill. It is constantly pulled from its old foundations to find a new balance at a higher level with a higher capacity. It must create more and more and bigger companies. It must reproduce production on an ever larger scale, or to put it capitalistically, capital must accumulate constantly. Because the profitability of capital is the purpose of capitalist production, and therefore profit is the driving force, And because only the living labor force can generate surplus value, every capitalist must strive to employ as many workers as possible, that is, to produce as much as possible. In this quest for profit, the various business groups face each other. Each group wants to secure as much as possible of the surplus value that is squeezed out of the working class. The hunt for the prey becomes a mutual battle for the prey, or to put it simply, they compete against each other. This fight for prey is the great revolutionary in production. Every company has to be prepared to produce cheaper than its competitors, so that the pursuit of profit means the pursuit of technical improvements and ever newer labor-saving machines have to replace the old ones. If a company, for example, in the steel industry, succeeds in finding a new, cheaper production method, this company will have reduced the value of the capital of all its competitors. The other capitals are obsolete, or as Marx calls it, the victim of moral wear and tear. However, this only means that the profitability base of these capitals has disappeared, so new capital must be added if the old capital is not to be completely destroyed. It goes beyond the scope of our considerations to address the immense waste of social goods, as well as the crisis and other disasters that the struggle for prey entails. 
For our subject, it is only important to point out that the constant renewal, the reproduction of the tools, is an individual function of the capitalists. It is up to them to decide whether and to what extent it will be renewed. Not, of course, by taking the needs of the people as a guide, but by concentrating on the profit opportunities offered by the struggle for prey at this moment. Okay. Now, I don't think there is too much new for us to discuss in that section. I think it's nicely written. I think the most important thing is the sentence it just says here about what is... Let, let, let me just read the final sentence here that Alan just read again for discussion. For our subject, it is only important to point out that the constant renewal The reproduction of the tools is an individual function of the capitalists. It is up to them to decide whether and to what extent it will be renewed, not, of course, by taking the needs of the people as a guide, but by concentrating on the profit opportunities offered by the struggle for prey at this moment. Well, that's the key kind of thing you need to break, that dynamic you need to break to get rid of the capitalist value form. Anybody have any comments on this whole section at all alex yeah just a small one can you scroll up to page 102 yeah the, that, that paragraph there be, begin because the profitability of cattle i mean it, it's probably not very important for the, the whole argument but i don't think that's quite uh, accurate so each capitalist isn't really striving to employ as many words as possible they want as many words as possible to be employed but not by them I want my factory to be run by robots, but I still want workers to be by my goods. Yeah, that, that's true. Like, I, I think the system, you know, uh, yes. wants as much as possible and the individual wants yes. as few as possible. And that's exactly, the, great, yes. the great contradiction. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit sloppy, them saying that, actually, to be honest with you. Worth noting that. Yeah, okay. you replace every capitalist with capitalism. then. Might, yeah. It, it, I think it would solve it. Yeah. But of course, I mean, also, when I said, well, I suppose even capitalism as a system doesn't want to employ as many words as possible because it wants a pool of unemployed. Well, it wants both, doesn't it? It wants to yeah. employ loads and have plenty not working at the same time. <laughs> you know, yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. Like it, it preferred to have more workers and also more unemployed. Yeah. Because that'd be yeah. more profit. <laughs> Anybody else? Alan? Uh, just a little nitpick. At the very beginning, they kind of frame it frame you know the production process in general so i'm i'm guessing that really means the the sort of trans historical just the fact that you have to do labor no matter what society you have but they frame human labor as a fight against nature and uh that certainly is true in a capitalist system but i would think uh we would want to have more of a uh, you know marx talks about metabolic relations with nature and all that so maybe in the in the communist society it shouldn't really appear as a fight against nature, I would think. But that's just a little nitpick. I do agree to there. It doesn't have to be seen. I think that's quite a nearly a capitalist way of looking at things is everything, you know, as a fight. The emphasis on, you know, fight of all against all part of evolution as opposed to the cooperative element. Kielce. Isn't that more uh, entropy, really? It's, it's, it's saying that sort of everything decays away and that You've got to invest to uh, produce things for the future, and and that, I, I get how we could move away from that with stuff like I don't know, sort of better agriculture that's more just sort of self reproducing and, and permacultures and things. But it, in general, we all grow old. We all need to to to, to reproduce um, our families and so forth. Yeah, well, I think I think it's more like what, what was the section here? What was the quote exactly? Let's see here. With the help of machines and tools, human labor fights against nature in order to distribute a stream of labor products over the earth using natural raw materials. In what in what kind of sense would like rolling a piece of a tool down a hill consist of a fight? <laughs> you know, so I, I think there's probably I, I know what you're getting at, Kilsha, with the process of reproduction and kind of been uh, linked to uh, entropy, but I think also some of the language here. I think is pretty kind of a capitalist. Right. Are we good on this section? Will we, will we head on to the next bit? All right. Chapter seven, communist production. A, the transfer of goods. Before we take a closer look at the general rules of production and distribution, for a good understanding, we must first understand why communism has no exchange and no value. 
we have seen that the explanation of the official text interpreters regarding Hilferding's general cartel in the Marxist sense cannot be correct. So the question rightly arises, if it is not so, then what is it like? Despite all the learned books written on the subject, the abolition of these categories is still hidden in the deepest darkness. But it is especially important not to make things more difficult than they really are. The point is that you have to own something in order to exchange it. Those who have nothing, who own nothing, have nothing to trade. The exchange is therefore not only an economic act, but rather a transfer based on private property. The exchange is therefore an economic act that expresses the social relationship that the products of labor are privately owned. The social revolution, the revolution in social relations, the revolution in the mutual relations of people and social life of operational units abolishes this social relationship. It brings the products of labor into common ownership. Exchange, which is a function of private property, is thus abolished because under the altered circumstances, no one can give anything except his labor and because, on the other hand, nothing can pass to the ownership of individuals except individual means of consumption. In communism, operational units are equal parts of a closed whole of the entire production and distribution process. Each operational unit carries out only one partial activity by passing on its product to the other until it is suitable for consumption. However, this transfer of goods is not an exchange because the owners of the products do not change in the flow of goods. The new legal relationship between the producer and the manufactured product is therefore the same as for the means of production. It belongs to the community. Just as operational units receive machines, buildings, and raw materials to process them independently for the community according to certain rules, they must also independently pass on their products according to the rules applicable in the production process or consumption. The operational units thus direct and control the production and distribution of their products in the name of society, i.e. in responsibility to society. Common parlance, however, does not distinguish so exactly between economic terms. In ordinary language, therefore, attention is paid only to the nature of the transfer of goods, which, of course, also takes place constantly in communism. And here, this transfer is perhaps also called exchange, even if this transfer has meanwhile assumed a completely different content. However, we do not want to set a bad example by using an old word for a new term. That is why we are constantly talking about the transfer of goods. So there's quite a lot going on in this section where we're talking about exchange here. So he makes this general initial point is like, we must first understand why communism has no exchange and no value. Okay, so the deep core reason here for there's no exchange is because everything is communally owned. You know, there's not a transfer of ownership when I buy a car, it's not being transferred from ownership from me to you, or that's probably not as good a, an example because that's kind of like a consumption thing. But let's say uh, one company sells a machine to another company, that there is a strict exchange there between separate economic units under capitalism, but they have different owners. Those two companies will undoubtedly probably have different owners. But in, in communism, it's a transfer within within a communal ownership. So it, it, it is fundamentally different. So it's an expression. He says here it's an expression of an economic act based on private property. Let's let's read this this sentence here of this this little phrase here. The exchange is therefore not only an economic act, but rather a transfer based on private property. Exchange is therefore an economic act that expresses the social relationship that the products of labor are privately owned. Okay, anybody have any things to say on this section? Alex. Yeah, it's the towards the end of 105. So they must also independently pass on their products according to the rules applicable in the production process or consumption. Now, that's the, I think one of the weaknesses of the book is not only doesn't it go into the, like, the details of that, it doesn't even acknowledge what I imagine would be the huge difficulties uh, of that. So I assume that by like the rules are, of consumption are that you know there's just an equitable consumption by you know, uh, 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 all the people. What are the rules for, you know, I produce steel, who gets my steel? You know, the, 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 that, that would be a hard problem. Well, I don't think it is a hard problem because really? you would, like, for example, like what happens under capitalism? 
Right, I'm a steel producer in yes. Sheffield. I, yeah. I'm, produ I'm producing my steel. I have a fair idea what bulk of orders I get in. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's if it's going to Japan or if it's going yeah. to Sweden or if it's going down the road to Doncaster, right? Yeah. I just know that there are a certain amount of orders coming in. Yes. Yeah. So similarly under communist production, what you are, we produce the amount of steel necessary to requirements that are coming in that are being sent to us. We want this, we want this amount, and we produce according to that, and we know okay. where to send them. You're right, but, but there's a constraint on that. So that if you're the people who are buying the steel from me, they won't buy 10 times the amount of steel they need because there'd be like, no way to, to run a business. They, they run out of money. If I'm not paying for it, if I'm just making note of the production time that the steel making made, I might be inclined to go, oh, you know what, it'd be handy to have a bit of extra steel in. Like, what the hell? Let's order twice. So yeah. let, let, let's dig into it, because these are these are all the things we should be hitting today. This is why I think today is going to be, we mightn't get through all the stuff, because this is where we're starting to hit the real rubber hits the road of the process. So let's imagine your example, we have a, a scissors yeah. maker, okay, a, a scissors workers council, and they, they usually need one ton of steel a week. Yeah. And they say for some reason, let's just order two tons yeah. and just build up a whole load of steel in our warehouse, right? In that scenario, what would happen? We would see that the price, we would see that the amount of raw materials that are going in to those scissors would have doubled. Okay? Yeah. So within so within the guild, they would notice, well, hey, you know, what we say, Alex's scissors over there. What the hell yeah. are they playing at? Their prices, their operate, yeah. you know, their productivity has just gone sure. through the floor. I, I, I mean, that's simple like example, yes, but, you know, with... With the dynamic, with an economy that is dynamic, it'd be harder to to, to see this kind of stuff. I think you it's know, easier. It, it, I think it's really? easier. Yeah, because like if you think about it, like what you know, what happens in capitalism, you know, they would go bust. You know, what would happen in a in a system like yeah. this would be that the price would uh, of all of the scissors in the unit would go up, and that was being recorded in real time. People can see the information is all open. So the guild would act as a regulator of the individual firm. And if all the guilds were doing it, society act as a regulator on the guilds. So whether that is the machine manufacturers who know what the productivity should be, the scientists who designed the machines, the people who are working in there see the fraud. There's numerous different levels where they can see this. You know, they can also be able to see indicators for the amount of raw materials required to to make products that can all be open and if we see big spikes in that it's very easy for a kind of a, a cybernetic system to go boo alex's one has gone crazy what's the problem here it it could raise it to a higher workers council who could investigate i think it in like something like that is just very easy for the I, system i think it's doable I, I i don't think this is easy at all and i think the book assumes away the the complexity of it well, like, for why is it not easy then? Explain why it's not. Really? Uh, thousands or millions of different inputs? Uh, uh, an output isn't easy? Well, I don't think many, many products have millions of inputs. Usually products have no, 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 handfuls have of inputs. inputs. When you look at the economy as a, as a whole, there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of inputs or, you know, tens of thousands of inputs at least. When you look at the yep. economy uh, as a whole. In reality, what you would have is systems of councils that would literally, their job would be to look for outliers. And the systems are built in, the information cybernetic systems are built in so that they can literally go, oh, problem here. It, you only ever get the information. You only ever look at the information if there are outliers. Yeah. And so right. you, 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 you write software as well, don't you, Tom? I do, yeah. So you've got experience of like, you know, people who like designed like vaporware and like everything's going to work you know beautifully and smooth and it's going to be fast you know you must have seen that that, that you know experience that, that, that many times this sounds a little like that you know a lot of times you, you won't know what the problems are until you hit them well i don't know like i think that these type of problems are the same type of prob same type of things that amazon and walmart and these things use every day in their planning systems but we're just applying sure. them here you know, um, Will had his hand up. 
So I agree, like, if, if people are just, you know, doing weird stuff, like deciding to double their order of steel, that'll all be really easy to, yeah. to see. But there's no, like, rationing principle they put forward, right? Under capitalism, like, yeah. you know, very, very recently, there's been a, a lumber shortage, right? And the principle is very simple, right? You know, you raise the price and whoever can afford the more expensive lumber for building things gets it, right? Here, there's no such principle. And we have this idea that the operational unit is supposed to have independent disposal over their work product, right? And so, so that would seem to imply that they would get to decide where it goes, right? But now here they're introducing these rules, right, of the production process and consumption and, and how do those merge and what's the rationing principle? So, okay, two good points. So the first one here is that, like, they process them independently, okay? So they are the people in charge of doing the work and doing the processing between them and their guild, essentially. Usually it'll be just be the factory unless new stuff has to be bought, new processes or new machines or whatever, then it probably goes to a guild level. They must independently pass on their products. So that's not that's not saying, saying they must decide who to independently pass them on to. So this is more of making the point is like, you know, the steel manufacturer will deliver the steel to the companies who consume the steel manufacturers. I think that's the point they're making. So when it comes then to uh, the idea of like, you know, prices like you're talking about as a as a way to, to as a, essentially as a way to ration under capitalism, I, they're not putting forward a price mechanism, you know, a market mechanism to allow that type of rationing behavior, not in that way. So the the thing that would be done in that scenario you would think would be society making decisions on what are the higher priorities so there's mm -hmm. a lumber shortage in the american communist <laughs> worker state so the the society would say we've got a 20 percent reduction in lumber and they would kind of go what's our least you know what are our highest priority lumber functions we're going to prioritize it to those operations i just think that's how they would say to handle that so, so then they're telling the firms how much they should work, right, to meet that quota. And then they're telling them where the product should go once they've made it, right? Well, society is doing that anyway, I think, but, to a certain extent. They don't tell the individual <laughs> workers how much they have to work. But they're saying society as a whole is saying we want this amount of mm -hmm. product, you know, and they go to the guilds and go, will you do this stuff for us? Well, where does it say that in the book, Tom? Where does it describe the system whereby... They go, your society goes to the guilds and the guilds go to the factories uh, and so on. So I don't recall that bit. I, I think it essentially just assumes away the, the, the whole difficulty of this by not mentioning Well, I, I don't think so. I, it's, we're going to get to, like, it doesn't get into it that explicitly, some of it. Yeah. I'm just talking about how I, how I, I mean, how even I. Like, honestly, you know, it's a very hard problem that involves, like, you know, a lot of, you know, hard, like, computer science. This is a harder problem than that. I'm not, I'm not saying it couldn't be done. I'm saying this book really doesn't go into it. There you go. I said I wouldn't get annoyed at this chapter and look at it. Yeah, you did already. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I would. I would fundamentally disagree with that. You can't do this. I just think that's capitalism. Oh, no, I, I'm not saying like capitalism do essentially it's not, it's does not. it. I'm saying this book didn't go into it. Well, I think it does. I think it doesn't go into the explicit structure of the higher councils and how they all interoperate but it goes into yeah. the fundamental operating principles of the core stuff. And it does talk about how the guilds operate and it does talk about how you calculate price at the guild level. The, the beauty of this actual chapter seven here is that it's going to get us into talking about lots of operational detail. Okay. But say, for example, like I think it's look at what happens under capitalism for the COVID vaccine. How do they, how do they decide who gets it? in the UK right now? Are they deciding on who's got the most money? No. No. How did he decide it? Well, they like, calculated the health benefits from giving like one or two jabs to people of various ages. And okay. So they yeah. looked at society and they decided a, a, a plan based oh, yeah. upon on which is the highest priority. I'm, I'm not saying this can't be done. I'm just saying this problem is 10,000 times harder than the one you just described. Well, that's, you see, what you're doing is like what happens when people just look at these things is that they'd actually think about well what if we did uh, what if if this was, was a shortage of this right yeah. but but in reality in in capitalism there is you know things just get produced all the time and there is rarely shortages you're like uh, ob you know obviously there are shortages sometimes and there are shortages in certain places but actually production takes along until crisis 
right? And under, we don't have crisis mechanisms here. Now, you most likely are going to get problems in production that the types of what you're talking about from natural events, so crops, that kind of stuff that's dependent on weather, and also perhaps, you know, things that have been destroyed by weather, not mm -hmm. just crops. So the vast, the vast majority of stuff takes along. And where things aren't taking along, they go to higher, you know, they go to planning workers' councils to help decide what will happen and to society in general. I don't think that's a stretch. Like the, this idea that everything is all crazy all the time is, is madness. It's probably going to be the case. It's particularly if you look at the places where crises occur in capitalism, it's usually something to do inherently with the capitalist system that's causing those crises. There isn't, a, there isn't a crisis in general of production most of the time. It's very, very rare. Sure, but the example you, of the rationing, right, that's done by the NHS or, or even the American government around vaccines, like that's pretty command and control, you know? They made a decision on high and they can tell these people what to do. Yeah. And this book is trying to say that it wouldn't really work that way. It wouldn't be that kind of command and control while also kind of trying to give the guarantee that, you know, the plan's going to work out and it's going to be rationed properly, right, from on high based well, on society's priorities. Well, no, I don't think this book ever makes the case for rationing on high. Like, just because the NHS does it through mm -hmm. a state system doesn't mean the, like this is saying we need people in charge to say what the lumber proportions would be or the COVID proportions would be. That would well, be a, a, a society, right? Like exactly the representatives who are like above the operational units in some way in the, in the sense that they can tell them what to do. And, and you know, like it can be more democratic and then, well, it could, well, it doesn't yeah. have to be representatives above them. For example, it could mm -hmm. go to a plebiscite or whatever, you know, plans could be drawn up different ranges of solutions, four or five different solutions that experts think are good or that communities have input on and designed them and then everybody gets to decide. Like it's not like the, the I think to say because that the NHS does it one way or that Biden does it another way that we're just going to say, oh, we have a state doing it that way. That's that's fundamentally but, not the point. Yeah, no, I'm not trying to say it has to be like bourgeois state or any kind of state, just that like the operational units will have to be subordinated to the will of society. And they don't have the kind of independence that this book tries to present in some ways, right? Like they're, ultimately they, they're accountable to the rest of society and they can tell them what to do. Ultimately, like, yes, ultimately society, you know, the, the problem with capitalist relations is that society is literally not in charge or has got no recourse to all this stuff. This book is making the case explicitly that the workers have you know kind of control over everything they need to have control over and you know in 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 other cases where it's just, like for example like the workers just can't go and produce way too much stuff because they want to right society will not give them the raw materials or or reproduce their their fixed capital to allow them to just produce five times what society needs mm -hmm. so obviously they can't do it obviously there's a there's a tension here between society as a whole and the individual but nobody is making the case that like these workers councils exist outside of society Kilcher, i had so many points i was going to make so many things came up just drawing on what people have just been talking about right now for me the idea that society and workers can 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 say what should be done or shouldn't be done speaks against the sort of the promise that the book has had so far for me which is that what we're really talking about here is an alternative to our capitalist system of accounting. So we're, we're talking about alternative rules by which if you leave things to their own devices within a system, they will self-optimize. And, and, and to, to draw on that computer science analogy, uh, you know, a, a better system is one that self-stabilizes within, within certain parameters. So here for, for something as day-to-day -day as the manufacturing of, of the pair of scissors or, or say manufacturing a vaccine, you'd hope that the the accounting rules that we'd have would, would take care of the complexity of like how much plastic do you need or, or a piece of paper do you need to make the, 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 the bits in the vaccine kits and all that stuff. Whereas you're still going to have all of that command and control of like, you know, you know, pushing them from the outside on like, I want a million of these vaccines and people are making those decisions. But the, there, there's, a, there's a system in place at the micro level, which is, which is actually 
optimizing at, at, at some level there. So I'm, I'm hoping the book is going to is going to not necessarily explain how all of that will work in, in the grand scheme, but at least give us building blocks that compose together to to allow us to imagine how, how such an alternative uh, vision for the world could exist. I think what we'll do is we, we, we'll move along because I think we're just going to, as we get through some of this stuff, maybe we'll get some of these nuggets we argue about and might crystallize in people's heads some of this stuff. I, I think it, that it, how it works, but maybe I'm wrong as well. Maybe you'll you'll convince me that I'm I'm, I'm back as <laughs> ways. Um, can, can, I, can I offer one other thing on, on the actual this actual section? Because I yeah. think every, nearly everything we've talked about is kind of like about the whole book as a whole. One thing that, that worries me in this section is is this sort of focus on on the community, whereas I'd hope that we'd see sort of multiple communities interacting. And, and I don't really understand how that's going to happen. So to, to borrow on some of the things you've been talking about, I, it worries me that you might have a single guild that decides everything, whereas actually you, you, it, it feels like you, you might you might have multiple guilds around regions of the world that need to establish ways to interact. And then suddenly I'm, I'm, I'm less sure that we're completely getting away uh, sort of getting rid of exchange fellow jitzer herman <clears throat> yes i think if they talk about these societies and i mean as a society which is based on common rules and common rules uh, means that this is a working time calculation so of course we have uh, different operational units and guilds or, or so but they all work on common rules which is a, is a working time calculation on the uh, side of the needs and on the side of the work. And this is the difference to the, to the market where uh, the connection is value-based. So I think this is what they are firstly talking about instead of, of market-priced uh, connection between the different operational units, you have a society which is based on the, on the common rule of uh, working time calculation, where it's absolutely clear that the needs match the the work which is offered by the people because the, the people calculate their needs in accordance to what they want to offer on their work site and therefore for the society this will match the needs the individual consumption and the work which is available for producing the, those goods and i think this is this is what they first here talk about and then the second level is um how the decisions will be made, what kind of products should be produced, how many steel or how many shoes. But this is a, this is the second step. The first step is how the society connects consumption and production in, in difference to, to, to a capitalist society. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I, I think... The fundamental thing here is to think about exchange as well, Kielce, is it's not like, so this is the content and form, you know, this is the idea of form and essence. You know, the form is we will see goods flitting around the economy, much like under capitalism, but like the essence of it is different because they're changing based on labor time exchange. Okay, so equivalents are being changed. And also, you know, there is no difference between exchange value and value. It's just the, the price, the labor time price. But also, there is no change of ownership. OK, so the this change, sometimes in capitalism, we have exchange done purely for arbitrage purposes and all kind of manner of weird things going on and different rates of exploitation over here and over there. So the actual content, the essence of that exchange is different. OK, so I think we will always have products changing hands physically, but the content of what is involved in that exchange of social relation is different. Right, let's give Alan a rest. Who wants to take the next section here, B, production time? Alex. Section B, the production time. The same conceptual transformation takes place in relation to the value. The exchange of goods does not take place arbitrarily, but in a certain proportion. The exchange takes place on the basis that the goods embody the same amount of social work. This amount of labour is its value. The value is therefore the socially necessary amount of work that is in a product. It is immediately noticeable, however, that it is precisely a demand of the communist economy that we need to know how much labour each article of consumption requires for production. It follows then the transfer of goods in capitalism comes about on the basis of the social work contained in the products. 
and also in communism. Just as the transfer of goods in capitalism comes about on the basis of value, so it also seems to be in communism. But this is by no means the case. The contradiction of capitalist production is social production on the one hand, private property on the other. The movement of goods takes place because of private owners exchange their goods. The relationship in which the goods are exchanged is determined by their value, i.e. by the socially necessary labour needed for their production. Private ownership of the means of production also means, however, that social labour itself, as labour power, becomes value, i.e. it is exchanged by the wage labourers on the same basis as the goods. In the goods movement of capitalism, the antagonism of capitalist production is thus expressed once again. Exchange of values, i.e. social work, as private property. In communism, the separation between producers and means of production was abolished. The means of production are no longer the property of a separate class. Social production is administered collectively. The products are not transferred by private owners, but passed on within the community. The goods are transported based on the working time required by society. In communism, the contradiction between social production and private property is abolished. In the movement of goods under communism, the distribution of goods, the unity of common management and social production is expressed. From this, we can see that in communist operational life, the amount of work required for the production of individual objects of daily use means something quite different than value. Analysis quite possible again, as in common usage, the value of goods in communism is spoken of, though the term has acquired a completely different meaning. Here, too, we do not want to set a bad example by using an old word for a new term, so that we speak of the production time of the goods. Instead of saying that the flow of goods through exchange moves on the basis of value, we therefore say that the flow of goods is passed on the basis of production time. Although the movement is externally the same as in capitalism, the form of movement has been completely changed by the elimination of the value form of money and the content of the term through the transition to common ownership. Or, as Marx puts it, within the cooperative, society based on common ownership of the means of production, the producers do not exchange their products, just as little does the labour employed on the products appear here as the value of these products, as a material quality possessed by them. Since now, in contrast to capitalist society, individual labour no longer exists in an indirect fashion, a detour of private property, but directly as a component part of total labour. Here, obviously, the same principle prevails as that which regulates the exchange of commodities, as far as this is exchange of equal values. Content and form are changed, because under the altered circumstances, no one can give anything except his labour. And because, on the other hand, nothing can pass to the ownership of individuals except individual means of consumption. From this, we can see that communism by Marx is by no means a negative system. Instead of the regulating functions of money, there is the registration of the flow of goods, the social accounting, based on the average social working time and thus based on the average social production time, which is carried out in the cooperative context of producers and consumers. The market, which is a measure of need for capitalists, is completely abolished. It is abolished by the direct connection between consumer organisations and production. This connection is the very subject of planned production. Although the socialist economists go beyond their fantasies in this very area, in a later consideration of the market, the planned production is treated only marginally by us. The reason for this is that it does not fall within the scope of this writing. It falls outside the fundamental principles of operational life. The plan production can only be built based on economic principles. Therefore, these principles must first be clarified. The plan production is, therefore, a completely different subject. But since the experiences of the Russian Revolution, it can also fall into the area of exact research. See also Frederick Pollock's, I think it's Experiment in Planned Economy in the Soviet Union, 1917 to 1927. This work does not provide any criticism of Russia, but only wants to show how the struggle for market control has taken place over the last 10 years and is still taking place. Okay, quite a quite a session here, 
bit of Marxology, everything thrown in. Yeah, we're getting into here why things are different under their system they're talking about, labor time planning here. The same conceptual transformation takes place in relation to the value. The exchange of goods does not take arbitrarily, but in a certain proportion. Okay. So basically he's talking he's talking about like this kind of communist value or whatever we want to call it. And why it's different, because the contradiction of capitalist production, which is social production on one hand, you know, people working together in factories, proles, doing stuff, and private property on the other hand, the owners, and that the exchange takes place in that principle. But for us now, it's going to be very, very different for us. Yeah, we hope. Things are going to be based on the labor time planning. So again, he's, he's talking here about this change in content a- and form. So the actual distribution and how the goods will distribute will change. So the form itself and some of the processes involved in that distribution, some of the phenomena we would see in capitalist distribution of goods will change under communist distribution, but not just the surface, what we see, the epiphenomena, but also the content, the core underlying principles governing it are going to change. The products are not transferred by private owners, but passed on within the community. Anybody have any things to say about this stuff? Will? I mean, kind of to what we were saying earlier, when they say, you know, basically they're they're not going to do a treatment of planned production. I mean, that's kind of what we were getting at earlier, right? Is how is this plan drawn up and how is it enforced, right? And and so they say we're not going to really treat that, which is fine, like, because I think this is an important point they're making about the labor time accounting and as being superior to money or, you know, planning in kind. But yeah, they're kind of just admitting that they're not covering everything. Yeah, they they look, they explicitly say it down here at the end, don't they? About yeah. when they talk about uh, Russia, and I do think I do think that in places though they still do hint at it. It's not as simple, like because they do get into into some of it, but they definitely don't get into explicit details of it. Because honestly, I think that it's quite dependent, you know. And I think there's many solutions you could, you know. There's a kind of an infinite number, probably of decent solutions you could get sitting on the proper foundations you know like we just have to look to capitalist nations they have different various laws organization and firm sizes and stuff like that but like it's the core underlying value form is the thing that's important to their operation yeah and and their fundamental principles i think are basically still right today if they tried to actually give a real treatment of planning, given the technology and mathematics at the time, I think it wouldn't be as applicable today. You know, they're saying these are just the fundamental principles, right? And the fundamental principle of like labor time accounting and autonomy in the workplace are still solid principles to this day, right? If they'd tried to outline exactly how planning for production would work at their time, you know, technological advances would make Make a lot of that irrelevant. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think I saw, was it Alex's hand? Yeah, I was just going to say the uh, second paragraph on page 110, I think they're hinting as the way it, it might be done. They mentioned the direct connection between consumer organizations and production. They may just be assuming this, but I think in the late teens or maybe around 1920, the Soviet Union, they did create like quite a few different consumer organizations for like different sectors of industry to try and manage this. One for textiles, there was one, I don't know, for the, for the various sections to exactly you know, to try and do some planning within different sectors. Yeah, that's one of, one of the things like they actually kind of very much praised the Russians for was how quickly and well they set up their distribution units. I don't know if they actually said it here, but they definitely say it somewhere. I can't remember. I don't think we've actually hit it yet. Kiltia. Just wondering if it's a little bit disingenuous to say we don't need a market because we've got a direct relationship between the producer and the consumer based on how much effort it takes to produce something in in, in man hours, uh, when one function of a market is to signal demand and we're completely bypassing any discussion at the moment of how that happens instead under such a system as this. You know, like it's kind of along the lines, I think, of how they say, you know, there is no exchange, you know, there's no money. As in, the, when they say there's no market, there is not a capitalist market. But there will be a very tightly knit links between consumption distribution points and production points. 
you know, much the way that, say, today, Amazon or Walmart, their production and their distribution are kind of linked. So, like, you know, we have a, a shortage of diesel engines right now. You know, they've there's been 20% more have been sold this week than we expected. That would be reflected back to the immediately, you know, electronically or whatever, through these distribution guilds to the production guilds. So I think that element of the market like that actual demand supply element is kind of inherently still there. Now, the rise in prices to do with shortages and stuff like that, like that element is not there. And the post hoc justification for production is also not there. Herman. The planning process. Um, they, they don't want to talk about the planning process because this is not really the critical point. If you imagine how it's planned in capitalism, take I order something from Amazon, then Amazon, um, they get my money and they get the order. And with this order, they order from their uh, sub suppliers, raw materials and everything. So the planning process is very similar in a communist organization because there is the same. I order from a company and they organize accordingly uh, the supply. Uh, the big difference, and this is what they are talking about, is that uh, in capitalism, I order based on money, which means uh, something completely different than I, when I order based on working time calculation. And I think this is absolutely the subject which is important. And the way it's organized behind this working time calculation is more or less the same. So therefore, I don't understand why some of you feel that there is a critical point missing in this book. Can I come back on that? Yeah. Uh, I love it when Perman offers his explanations. This is a fantastic. It's really helping me. Um, I think the, the example I'm thinking of, and, and it's a great one because capitalism is dealing with it really badly as well, is the global shortage of silicon chips at the moment, where there isn't enough production of silicon chips for the global economy. And then how do you decide in the two years it takes to scale up more production of silicon chips, where the silicon chips that you've got get distributed. And that's being done by prices going up for silicon chips. And then the industries which think that, you know, well, people will still buy TVs if they're more expensive, or people will still buy cars if they're more expensive, compete to, to, to set the price that m manages that, that, that market. When there is a, a fixed production of silicon chips within this, this communist system, um, we don't have a mechanism for allocating those. And so that's, that's one example that, that, that immediately came to mind. Well, let's just look at that one, for example. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think, am I right to say a lot of the the stuff that's problem with the silicon chips now is Bitcoin mining? <laughs> yeah, that's certainly part of it. <laughs> yeah. So, so, for example, that absolute spike would not happen under a communist society because communists would say we, we we would have a plan for what we want to be doing and using these things for you know there's in no sense would you say it's an extra 20 percent it's just suddenly gone into like bitcoin mining for no reason uh, yeah so, I think like, that's, that's specious for getting rid of it. i mean there was a there's a, one reason is that um lots of factories shut down last year for the covid yeah i know yeah. it's a combination of things but like yeah definitely but uh, you know even if we look at the covid crisis <laughs> The actual existence of COVID as a goddamn thing is also a function of the capitalist system. <laughs> like, I think when we get into and we look at so many of these actual key core shortages of stuff, they are intrinsically linked to the value form. And that the vast majority of stuff will just tick along and have independent workers' councils just managing stuff independently and no one having to bother them. Like, you know, we wouldn't have the forest destruction. And if it did have a new virus come out, you would have proper like track and trace like they have had in the in the, you know, in China and some of these places, as opposed to the capitalist system where we're going completely out of control. No, I just think these are so interlinked. But so like, Will, the, yeah, sorry. Yeah. On, on the on the, you know, chips, right? Like some of the chips that there are shortages of are very simple chips that aren't really suitable for Bitcoin, that they're mainly used in cars. And, you know, part of it was factory shut down in Taiwan. And part of it is, you know, there's been a big backup at the port of LA. And so like, they're not getting it. So like, I don't think it's fair to just say like, oh, we'll never have any production shortages. Like, yeah, things will be better under communism. Yeah, like, we, all, we, all, we all agree there, <laughs> but that doesn't answer the question of like, what is the principle that, you know, regulates these things? 
And we do, I think we all agree what the principle is or should be that it's like society decides, but that's very vague, you know? And I think that's kind of what some people, and, and then how that gets enacted on independent operational units, there's a tension there that isn't really resolved to my mind. That, that's where I think the problem is. Thanks, well, that's not, exactly a problem, it. not a problem, you know? Yeah. Like, they, they say we're focused on this and it's okay to be focused on that, but I'd like an answer to that other thing. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair. So let's take like, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of being slightly facetious that, you know, look, <laughs> this wouldn't happen under communism. Obviously, there'd be shortages of stuff. Shit happens. But I think the, the level of, of it would definitely be reduced. So if you get to say something, I think like, let, look, let's look at this tension because I think there is a real tension here. Like, say there is a need to ration a raw material that's used like silicon chips in a number of industries. How do we choose? So say society says cars are more important than electric scooters or, or something like this. And so the, that would mean that the electric car workers have can get as much work as they want and the electric scooter workers, factory workers or whatever, are out of a job. OK, so I think, honestly, I think there's, there's definitely stuff to, de to decide there. Now, whether that's a fundamental underlying thing in society or not, or whether that's like a kind of a societal decision policy level, I kind of feel it's more like a policy level. Like you literally could say people get unemployment for that time and it's an increase in the tax rate for everybody. So I think those types of issues when uh, uh, there's a hard shortage and a rationing criteria needing to be made, I think like they can be easily accommodated at kind of a policy level as opposed to a fundamental principle level. I, I, that's how. That's what I would answer, Will. I, I don't know if that answers people. Yeah. If that, no, I mean, I, I agree. I think that makes perfect sense. It's just you're telling the operational unit, this is where your chip goes, right? It's not like free disposal over the work product, which, which I, it doesn't bother me. Like, I think that's a good well, principle in general, but like... like Remember, it's the free delivery. It's really the trans. This, this the transfer. It's the they're individually responsible for the transfer. But mm -hmm. like, what actually buys them is a decision of society, whether it's a consumption or a productive goods. Okay, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just an interface. It's like you you have to put things into this queue, but how you do it, we don't care. Exactly. Like, and you, it's like you know. The society as a whole would decide the electric scooter company, but we are mothballing it for six months, say. And but so the orders that come into the silicon chip manufacturers are now not coming from the electric scooter one, but they're coming just from, say, the automobile factory. So the electric chip company have now just the responsibility of not sending it to both factories, but to one. Mm -hmm. And that's in the sense that which they're independent. And that's the sense in which society decides. There is probably some, you know stuff that could easily be written on this. You know, I think that, but I think it's largely more of a policy level than a fundamental principle. Okay, so we're on to C. Anybody else now here want to give Alex a rest there? He did a long section there. Will. C, the method of investigation. To further investigate the transfer of goods based on production time, we use the usual method of simplification. For this reason, we will not at this stage consider any complications that might result from a change in the average social production time, such as the improvement of the rationality of operation and technological progress, in order to investigate the effects of these factors step by step. For the time being, we assume a simple reproduction, i.e., we assume that society does not decide to expand the production apparatus in order to dedicate a later chapter to the functioning of production on an expanded basis. D, communist reproduction. After these preliminary remarks, we can present the course of the communist economic life in a very simple and clear form. Each company calculates how much working time is spent on its product, i.e. it determines how many working hours of fixed means of production, machines and buildings, how many working hours of circulating means of production, raw materials and consumables, and how many directly consumed working hours flow into the product. Regardless of the type of operation, whether it is a sugar factory, a railway company, or an administrative body, it always consumes inputs, raw materials, and consumables, and direct work performed, so that each operation can determine the number of working hours that the product passes on to society. Or, to put it another way, each operation works according to the production equation. F 
plus C plus L equals product. Machinery and buildings plus raw materials consumables plus labor equals product. Note, transport companies and administrative bodies do not provide a product but a service. But that doesn't change anything. We'll come back to that later. If, for the sake of clarity, we replace the letters with fictitious numbers, the production, for example, in a shoe factory would be shown in the following scheme. Parentheses F plus C and parentheses plus L equals product. 1,250 working hours plus 61,250 working hours plus 62,500 working hours equals 125 Hundred thousand working hours. Okay, yeah. So let's let's just uh, see if we can make that a bit listenable. So what are they saying there? They're saying like there's one thousand two hundred and fifty working hours of fixed capital, so machinery and building de uh, depreciation, plus sixty one thousand two hundred fifty hours of leather and stitches, and then sixty two thousand five hundred actual working hours by the laborers gives us one hundred and twenty. 5,000 working hours worth of shoes. All right, continue there, Will. <laughs> All right. So machines, et cetera, plus raw materials plus work equals 40,000 pairs of shoes. That's an average of 3.125 hours per pair. However, if the shoe company wants to start a new production period, it has to replenish everything that has been lost in production. It must restore its wear and tear on production equipment, 1,250 hours, repurchase raw materials, 61,250 uh, hours, and reinstate 62,500 working hours of workers. After that, production can start again in the same way. The production equation thus immediately proves to be a reproduction formula. Each company reproduces itself, and thus the et entire social economic life is reproduced. To give the entire economy a clear form, we use the same production equation as we did for each individual company. In this formula, we find all the means of production available to society, as well as all the raw and auxiliary materials, and all the working hours used by the workers directly in production. The entire economic life is thus represented. F of T plus C of T plus L of T equals the total product. Note, the T index means total. If, for accuracy reasons, we use fictitious numbers for this purpose, we get, for example, F of T plus C of T plus L of T equals total product of 108 million plus 650 million plus 650 million equals 1,408 million working hours. The product mass of the entire social product, thus, comprises 1,408 million working hours. All operations together now take 108 working hours of production materials from this mass, a further 650 million of raw materials and consumables. At the same time, the rest, or 650 million, is accounted for by the individual consumption of the workers. This means that the entire social product is consumed, while all operations are reproduced so that a new reproduction period can begin. Okay. Very good. That thanks for the, the was that you barking well, was it? <laughs> that's that's my dog. Yeah. <laughs> yes. One so, of my two dogs. My last one was on the other podcast at the end. <laughs> was it? Yeah. Right. Okay. So these are the core equations. These are the equations equations that kind of made my brain snap. Okay. So th this the initial equation here we're going to look at is is the kind of mirror equation of the C plus V plus S of capitalism. So here we have our fixed and our circulating capital and our labor hours, and that's going to be the total value of the product. So, okay, it's the number of labor hours in our final product. And this idea that each company doesn't care about the rest of society, all they need to do is to be able to reproduce themselves. So when if they have like here 40,000 pairs of shoes and those shoes are worth 125,000 working hours, each is a price at 3.125. Once all of those shoes get sold, there's buyers for those shoes, that factory immediately reproduces itself at a static level. Okay. 
And if each individual firm doesn't have to worry about all the other firms, all these workers councils, this body, scientific body, the school over here, or hospital over, they don't care, they don't give a damn. All they have to do is worry about the process that produces these shoes and that we're selling and producing the right number of shoes. And then we ourselves will be able to reproduce our existence, much like in, in a similar way that a capitalist shop or a little factory doesn't care about all the other factories in, in capitalism and shops. It just has to do its own thing. OK, and then when we sum up all of these individual actions, this decentralized method of reproduction, we have societal level reproduction. And all of this will be based on labor time planning. Now, who wants to anybody have any discussion or, or any questions to ask on the what these equations mean or whether they think they're right or wrong or if there are problems or kind of things need clarifying? Anybody have any questions? Alex? No questions as to the correctness of the formulas. They're, they're, I think they're perfectly fine. It's the how you would collect the numbers. So the equivalent to the 61,250 working hours, so the, the, the stuff I've spent on the raw materials, or, or on the inputs to, to my factory. Yeah? So under capitalism, that would come from like a, a various number of sources and I would, you know, I would have, you know, my, my accountant would know how much we, we should be spending for on each unit of input from the many different different sources, and cares deeply because you know I've got that number wrong, I'll go you know, bank, bankrupt quickly. Here under the system, it's just a bit of bookkeeping. It doesn't actually matter. To the, that sixty one thousand two hundred fifty doesn't matter to the shoe factory. They don't really care about it. They're, what what's important to them is that just make a note of the inputs and add my 62,000 to it and then pass us along to the shop. Well, it does matter. Go on. Like, <laughs> I like the way Alex says go on to me. When I'm, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, go on. It means like, get the fuck out of here. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, it, it does matter. So we keep on keeping the same point as in like, what regulates like the individual firm? Why don't they buy just stupid, crappy amounts of shit? They are regulated like multiple ways. They are regulated by their guild. If one factory is just spewing pissing raw materials up against the wall, the other guild will say, well, hey, what's, the, what's the story? What are you doing this for? Why are you being so yeah. wasteful? Secondly, you're regulated by society. So, for example, if all the, all the shoe factories in a certain guild are taking the mick collectively, Society will be able to see that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so you're, you're right. Gross errors will be easy to spot. Yeah, that is true. Small errors multiplied uh, along the chain will be less easy to spot. And people don't have, you know, it doesn't, you know, what's the incentive to be accurate? So the chain. So what do you mean the chain? So, so we're talking. You go from like, you know, from, uh, you, if you imagine the sequence of process that, that end up in a, a pair of shoes. You go from like I don't know grass is grown to feed cows. They get killed. They get turned. Okay, but they get processed. There could be like 10, 15 steps before I actually produce uh, a shoe, and each of those steps will collect the hours worked by, by the step before, and then add their own working hours to it. And well, if I, they get that wrong, there's not a. If they get that a bit wrong, there isn't a huge cost to them. But you see, each at each step, they're regulated, Alex. And they're not only just regulated by society, they're also regulated by history. So society is regulated by, by their historical production levels, that they can't become more, more inefficient compared to previous years, because that will, that will come up. That's a regulating sure. aspect. What do you think the feedback on that's going to be, Tom? So the feedback on which... On, on, on the kind of errors I've described, how fast do you think that's going to get noticed? It's going to be the accounting period. Yeah, so the accounting period should be like, like, like there's no reason why the accounting period should not be at least at the, at the minimum daily for any of these things, pretty much. Oh, I don't know. I was thinking like quarterly, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> but why would they think quarterly? That's, that's just, not cybernetic just, thinking. It, well, it comes in lumps. Like you, well, you like, get like, you know, Ton, yeah, a ton of leather del delivered every three months or something like that. You, 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 you find it difficult to do it daily. Yeah, no, but that's... I mean, but you're talking about the production of, of leather being uh, inefficient. 
you would have it immediately if we have our production of our outputs. We have a shoe factory. We produce uh, 1,000 shoes a day. And 1,000 shoes a day, we also record the depletion of our raw materials. Yeah, And it's very simple indexes to show each day whether you're going out of whack. Like, we have, we, like we're talking about a cybernetic implementation of this stuff where things are absolutely real time, those things that are necessary. Okay, so we go from like guilds to maintaining it to cybernetic again. A board. I'm not, it's a combination. I think this is the way to go. Uh, it's just these are interesting and very, very hard questions. You know, so you've gone, right, we can't, we don't want central planning. We're not going to do that. We don't want like the market forces. We're not going to do that. We're going to have something else. What's that, Tom? Well, it's just going to take over. It's not that hard a problem. No, that's like, come on, you're completely misrepresenting what I'm saying here. Really? No. Yes. <laughs> like, for example, if we are building a ship that that is w delivered in two years' time, it's obviously a different problem that can't be reported on immediately. Sure. When you're talking about pr processes of production that are ongoing in factories all the time, and we have we have inputs that are going into these factories, and we have outputs that are going out to these factories yeah. that you know, like they do. In, in capitalist firms, they know immediately if shit's going wrong. No, but if they in, don't. A lot of capitalist firms struggle to see until it, yes. um, until it, their quarter has passed or more. No, sometimes. you're talking about the management at the higher ends because reporting is done on quarterly basis. But it's done on quarterly people... basis because it's hard. <laughs> Yes, well, it's it's done on quarterly basis. Is a lot of the times it's done on quarterly basis because well, it depends on the, what the scale of these firms are. Honestly, you know whether some of them are uh, more financially conglomerated rather than driven by the production. But there is no reason why within a paint factory they would not know in that paint factory that the the amount of raw materials are getting going crazy. But, but because stuff will come in in bulk, so it can be hard on a day to day basis to yeah, actually absolutely. see see if you've got a problem you, you need to you need to smooth these things out some so you're right absolutely right some like uh, retail propositions you can tell on a daily basis like a coffee shop or a timpsons will the, the ceo of timpsons will talk endlessly about how he can just open the cash to at the end of the day and work out if, the, if we're going into a recession or not but for for a larger like a manufacturer you you need three to six months sometimes to figure out if you're doing okay or not so you're saying that they cannot tell whether their 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 production systems are suddenly very wasteful or not, or there's problems in them for three to six well, months. It's very wasteful, Tom. But if it's grossly wrong, yes, that's easy to spot. If it's a bit wrong, that's very very hard. Okay. Well, like I think you know, I think you're, you're overstating the problem, and I think we're we're. I, I, I let me I let think me. You're massively understating it, Tom. Just a quick interjection here, I think, to clarify some of the issues that we're discussing here that might help the listener understand what I'm trying to get at in this argument. I'd just like to point out here that I think there is a bit of confusion around the idea of whether in production firms under capitalism have difficulty understanding if things are going wrong or not. And financially, firms usually conglomerates for reporting reasons doing things at a quarterly or annual basis, understanding their financial position as opposed to their production position. Like the just-in-time revolution from Japanese management, I think from as far back as the 1960s, has probably been implemented all over the world, I think it's safe to say, in factories to reduce costs on maintenance of stocks. You know, this is the type of thing we're talking about. This financial layer that exists under capitalism is an abstraction that really won't exist in the system we're talking about. So we're talking about picking up problems in production, the reporting of F and C and L in real time. I think that that is a reasonably trivial problem to solve, and it's not analogous to the quarterly reporting or yearly reporting of capitalist systems no more than it's difficult if we want to make the analogy between the for the accounting under communism with a bank account it is reasonably easy for a person to see if their bank account is in the red or the black at any particular point in time similarly for a company it's easily to see if their outputs are containing too much or too little of any input, whether fixed, circulating or labour. 
Okay, rant over. Back to the discussion. Can I ask Alex, like, because this this does specifically state that there will be a period by which you'll you'll calculate what you need to do to bring the the factory back up to to to, to par on this on this shoe factory. So why yeah. wouldn't that tell you if it was quarterly or, or every six months if you had a problem or not? I don't necessarily know the sixty one thousand number up front. I mean, if it you do, doesn't ch- oh, no, no, but you, you, you'd be able to tell. I do, but we know there'll be a range of working hours for for my inputs, depending on the efficiencies of the the, the you know, different companies I could be getting inputs from. But, but come come July, you would know whether January to to, to March for the previous quarter, you what? No, no, for for a particular shoe factory, you would know yes. you would know whether you you produce you know what the you know. What you see, so, uh, yeah, I, I would know what the working hours that the my uh, input providers told me. Uh, I, I would hopefully know that number, and I would uh, I, uh, I'd add it up correctly. I would hope that number is correct. It is correct by definition. That's what it is. It's nothing but, else. That's the price. Do no, you know no, that it, is. it's not correct. It's the number uh, another uh, a clerk in another company told me. No, it's the price that you. It's the price, much like a capitalist price. You buy your raw materials. You buy them. Yeah, but if, if it's I would... the price. There's nothing else. The depreciation you might have uh, errors in your depreciation estimate estimations, yeah. right? Yeah. But your raw materials are just a price. Uh, Herman wants to get in. Yes, I have difficulties to understand um, what the problem should be here. So, if we take first uh, capitalism and the whole uh, working process, so a company uh, which produces something, they add up all the prices from raw material to end product and comes up with the price for their products. And then it goes to the market and on the market, perhaps it discovers afterwards that some of their competitors were more productive. And this means that everything they produced is uh, worthless. So maybe the result is that they have to shut down uh, the whole organization and disappear from the market. This is roughly said uh, how capitalism works. And now uh, take uh, the communist uh, production process. Yes, of course, it's pro- is possible if they, if they add up the working hours similar to the prices from raw material to end product, it could be that they have a miscalculation in this. But compare this with the result compared to capitalism, it's a complete different result. While in capitalism, it's a disaster on a whole working process. In the communist organization, yes, there would be a mistake. And there would be maybe due to this mistake, a difference between supply and demand, and which means that they have to correct it afterwards. But you, you see, it's, it's, uh, where's, where's the big problem? It's uh, the big problem, I think, is on the capitalist side, which even does not does not count the needs of the people because it only counts the money based uh, demand. So it's it's a complete. So I, it's therefore I don't understand why you feel that the possibility of a miscalculation of the working hours cause such a big problem that this is not um, not workable. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm not saying it's not working, but, but it's different. I mean, when you say it's a price, it's not quite the same thing. So let's say my inputs go up by 5%. Right? My bill for my inputs have gone up by 5%. You need this many more working hours. Right? In capitalism, if that was money, I would go 5%. Well, hold on. Before I take the money out of my bank account, I'm going to investigate that check. Has there been an error? Can I get it cheaper elsewhere? Whatever. Under this system, I'm going to shrug and go, oh, it's 5% more. Maybe there's some shortage of, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, I'll just write down a number that's 5% bigger. I'm not going to look into it at all. People's behavior will be different. Okay, but that's not that's not relevant to the individual reproduction of an individual firm because an individual just needs to reproduce itself. Based mm. on it, this is a non-expanding. Remember, this, this one here is based upon, this example is based upon static production a simple reproduction, much like in capital, he deals with simple reproduction yeah. and then gets on to expanded reproduction. Yeah. There is yeah. no increase in crisis here. We have our, our depreciation of our fixed capital, we, yeah. we, which is an estimation, much like under capital. We have our prices of goods of yeah. our circulating capital, which is an exact price that we pay up front. That's a given. We know exactly how many hours we've put in. Yes. Our calculation of their total value of our of our individual goods is an exact thing. 
right? We don't need to worry about it. We then can calculate the price per shoe. Each individual firm under simple reproduction only has to worry about those three inputs in their one, sell their output and to, to be able to get back what they need to reproduce. Yeah, you, now, clearly in that scenario, yes. Yes, okay. So now you're getting to a point about what what you're getting to here, is, which is not really a simple reproduction thing, but it's getting towards how do we know that the price of the working hour of the working hour price of our inputs is actually a good, yes. a, an efficient price. Essentially, how can we can we know well, that people are taking the price? Even, even, even just it's, it is accurate, accurate in the sense of what because well, that's I, the price of all the average in the other guild, so it'll by definition be accurate. Like, the only thing that people could get away with would be misrepresenting the amount of labor they go in, but the price would still be the price. Um. Right. So if I was going to a shop to buy those inputs with listed price with stickers on them, then yes, they'll they'll be right. In practice, it's not going to be like that. I'm going to have, you know, relationships with different, you know, um, uh, people who who provide me with stuff. Well, you like more like who 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 knows? Like it could literally be an online on an online list. Like who like what happens if I'm a shoe factory now in capitalism? I probably have wholesalers that I deal with and this, that, and the other. Right. You know, like there may be a centralized version of something similar and you can see all the prices you get. They're the prices. You know, you're not getting jobbed. A quick aside here, just to put in a couple of points here that I think might clarify the discussion we've just had on this, as we seem to be arguing past each other somewhat. The point I should have made here is that there is only one price for that input you're using in your production process. Now, you might be able to change your production process and have a different input. Instead of using leather, you could use some hemp or whatever it is. But the price of that type of leather that you use will be averaged over all the producers. So the individual firms won't be trying to find the best price to keep their product cheapest. So that competitive pressure is not the pressure which leads to productivity in the productive unit. Like, I think that's kind of what Alex is somewhat getting to here. But there are other ways of enforcing the productivity as a goal within society and not through the competition in the marketplace. The productivity we get from the GIC proposal is not one through isolated firms operating in a marketplace under the pressures of competition but one organised socially, that is, a socially planned productivity with the emphasis on solidarity and not competition. In fairness to Alex here, the book itself doesn't really get into the mechanisms or expand upon how the planned production system can generate a productivity socially or what are the mechanisms therein. Safe to say there is a lot more to be written on the topic but you know the book really doesn't get into the nitty-gritty of how the economic measure and the structure of the councils and the plan of production will allow productivity to not be a problem as it obviously grew to be in the planned economies of the soviet bloc type countries right let's go back into the discussion The point here really being is that like this idea of how to reproduce itself is very, very simple because you're dealing with labor time, hour calculation and you know your own stuff and you're not dealing with in-kind production. We're seeing the reproduction, how it reproduces itself, the equivalent of how capitalism reproduces itself. I think we're getting kind of, we're we're not getting confused, we're just talking about a kind of a secondary issue is about the regulation of the reporting of accurate reprices, which is a separate thing. As in like, I think the idea of like, how to make sure that a individual firm is reporting their L, their working hours correctly, or how to make sure that they're being efficient with their use of F and C, their fixed and circulating capital or whatever you want to call it. That is a kind of a, a secondary issue above and beyond just the, the ability to reproduce itself. Sure. For example, the leather guild might all be taking the mick and be double reporting their hours so they get paid more. That was that can happen. Let's say that happens. Yeah, well, it, can't, it shouldn't be able to happen, but let's say it is happening in this one guild. 
okay? The price that they will be giving you for their like leather that you're buying your inputs will be twice as maybe twice as big as it should be. But sure. you but but you're paying that price. No more than under capitalism, sometimes you have to pay a, a you know, a, a what do you call it, a rent for a certain thing above and beyond its actual true labor time calculation. Yeah. But that's just going to be taken up in your reproduction and your cost of output. Does that yeah, make no, sense? Oh, no, no, all that makes sense. My, my point is a, the, a difference is that the accountant in my company who might have cared about the cost of those inputs is less likely to care about the costs. I, I think that's incorrect because I, I do, do you know why I think it's well, it's incorrect, Alex? It's because I'd say all of society cares, not just a goddamn accountant. Because if everybody's been overcharged, that means they get less personal consumption. Will. Well, and don't they say that later on, like that the, there would be a general social accounting apparatus that, that would be like in charge of, you know, recording this. And that's, you know, like the, that you would have, it wouldn't be the firm, you know, the firm would have to, do the accounting itself but like there would be some other apparatus that would it, that would be reported to and that would could check up on that right that's the blockchain baby the bl <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but absolutely like literally all this gets recorded in open system whatever that system is and like it is so easy to have literally just little like bots sitting on top that are literally looking for discrepancies and weird outliers so that society can interrogate them you know, yeah, I mean, something I mean, as simple I mean, as that. Communists in the past have not had a, a hard time uh, building good uh, spy networks, so they're, you know, they're <laughs> able to route these things out. <laughs> yeah, that's not a that's not a hard problem. And, and, and capitalism too. Let's let's get yeah. it straight. <laughs> Spies everywhere. Spies yeah. to the left of me. Um, any other uh, to this? No, because I think these are the fundamental equations. These are the things that I think is really good to get into people's. Well, it's really good to to argue about because I think this is the core basis of the book. This simple little equation, like it's such a goddamn stupid equation, you know. And so is like Marx's C plus V plus S. You know, it's hardly hard math, you know. But it's it's very this idea of the individual council or whatever factory only worrying about its own stuff, allowing itself to reproduce is the key thing to understanding why you don't need this massively centralized production planning. If we think about it, like it's it's so much more important that inside this shoe factory, that the people who are making these shoes are making the decisions from about what to do, what machines to use, what stuff to do. It's, it's inherently the correct place to make the decision. So I, I think that this kind of key equation and this total equation really show the beauty of that and why i think we need to get away from this goss plan idea i just think the efficiency the independence everything about it is is beautiful i guess my only thought so far would be i i, I agree that the, this equation of you know the working time is very simple and very appealing and you know we are talking about fundamental principles so you know these debates we're having about some of the administrative aspects are important, but it's maybe not, you could argue like the book says, it's not necessarily fundamental in this theoretical sense. I do wonder though, if we're missing, uh, I guess like externalities, you could say, um, you know, the reproduction time is so many thousand or million working hours, but maybe that assumes, you know, very unsustainable practices. Maybe I'm clearing out, <laughs> clearing whole continents for cultivation, like Marx says in Manifesto, or, you know, de destruction of habitat or, or using non-sustainable inputs and things like that do we need to factor that into this numerical aspect of the equation is is that a missing piece of the fundamental principles or are we comfortable moving that into the realm of sort of administration and the legal system aspect of it uh, a very very good point like i think the only way for i i just think that the the democratic aspect of society will be able to handle that. That's my under my, my underlying thought on it. You know, I think if society had not had, say, capitalist society were was actually democratic, and if we didn't have oil sector and all these people polluting our brains with counter propaganda about like fossil fuels and environmental hoax and all this, I think the society would rationally be able to come to decisions on what to do. And I think the same is the same here. And I think that's the level at which 
things would need to be done, not at the fundamental operating principles, because like you can like these principles here are agnostic to like wasteful or good inputs. You know, I mean, destructive, ecological or good inputs. Yeah. Uh, raw materials and such will. Oh, I, I was. It's OK. You mostly covered it. <laughs> I was just going to comment about how you might enforce well, some kind of uh, regulation around environmental stuff. But th stuff. there's a lot of ways you can do it in a democratic society, like where, like we agreed, like these firms are kind of answerable to society. You have a lot of ways you can bend firms to do what you want. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, you could literally say we have a target. Like, there's so many things that are easily implementable, you know, like getting rid of designed obsolescence, the right to fix plastic inputs, pl rapid kill the marketeers, you know, kill yeah. the bankers. There's so much of it that's literally independent of the, the principles here. I, I, I agree basically with all of that, but I just, I think it's easy to imagine, you know, an unsustainable practice that really cuts down on the required working hours. And that could be a situation where even in a properly functioning democratic system that we would make, you know, quote, the wrong choice. Then, then humans are are a fail are failed species, really, aren't we? That's the end of us, I think. Oh yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, like, I, I agree that it has to that it, the logic can't be relied on to happen at the firm level, right? Like, like you said, there's every incentive to try to save labor. You'd hope that people are so transformed that they have a more enlightened outlook, but that's not a guarantee. And that, yeah, you, you would have to rely on society to maintain the free gifts of nature. The same way we do now, right? Like, I mean, or the same way we don't now, right? Fundamentally, we're, we we should expect to see an actual like if we had a communist society and we were to to produce our agricultural stuff in a way that was like kind of copacetic with permaculture principles, we would actually have to see a a, a large increase in the amount of labor time spent on, I think, agricultural production, you know, ecosystem maintenance, you know, from whatever it is today, three or four percent we might have to double to eight or nine percent you know maybe people don't want to do that lousy work but maybe that's something as society we need to decide to do you know On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar.